and we are live enterprise hits and misses video show i've got a retail special for you guys today uh retail highs and lows with jake knowles of bjss uh jake and i met last year in in new york uh cir circumstances have dramatically changed but we are back H how you doing yeah i'm great thanks yeah always good to be back shame we can't do it in person like last year but yeah looking forward to catching up yeah absolutely so uh last year uh i i go to nrf every year to kick off the year in the in the bitter snow of new york but it's always a fun show and uh jake was kind enough to hop in the podcast chair last year so if you want to have a look at that podcast for a little background on last year that's still available um but um we had a really good talk and so i wanted to bring jake back because so much has changed i mean jake like in the Javits Center where you and I did that podcast somewhere in the basement where we found like a fairly quiet space three, about two and a half or three months after the Javits Center was a hospital. Um, and you know, that just gives you some idea of like what that year has been like. And, uh, and Manhattan has, has not recovered. In fact, NRF did an online only event this year. Um, hello, Thomas. Glad you made it to the show early. I think this show is going to be right up your alley. So definitely keep us posted. Um, but yeah, so, I asked Jake to come back on because so much has changed, um, but retail is obviously like a critically important sector that we all rely on right now. And I wanted to really get his, his sense of like what we've learned so far and what lies ahead in a very unpredictable year that, that Digitonomic has been calling the vaccine economy where we're not back to normal yet, um, but, but they're a little creeping in that direction and consumer behavior continues to confound all of us. And we're going to, we're going to get to that. And Jake's also got countdowns. This is a countdown show as usual, and he's actually got a visual prop there. So I'm looking forward to getting into his top five retail misconceptions and, and such. Uh, but anyhow, uh, Jake, uh, just tell us to start out with, what's it been like for you guys? I mean, you were out consulting on a ton of retail projects and then boom. So what happened? Well, it, sw it switched overnight, didn't it? In, in, in March last year, we were there kind of working, you know, side by side with our clients and then overnight we were, we were told to work from home so there was definitely a an initial shock factor and i think retailers around the world and and, and organizations around the world felt that uh, particularly for for consultants like myself you know i think the knee-jerk reaction was you know cut costs wherever possible and and stop those transformation programs and those projects in their tracks so there was probably a couple of a uh, couple of months of, of a bit of a quieter time but then it, it soon picked up again when i think retailers and again organizations realized that actually the way wasn't necessarily to, to tread water but there were actually things to be done and, and and i'm sure over the next hour or so we'll talk about some of those things and, and that innovation that has you know really driven forward in the, in the last year or so and there's been an incredible acceleration in what's been achieved across you know the technology and, and the customer experience space which has obviously you know seen COVID as the catalyst of all of that exactly and you know it's interesting because last year when you and i talked I, I was honing in on the theme of retail as a winners and losers market. And one, one reason I wanted to look at that is because, you know, when you put aside Amazon and Walmart, who arguably have some unfair advantages, how, how are other retailers excelling, right? That aren't, that don't have those unfair advantages. I think that's a very interesting question, but then COVID hit. And then I think a lot of retailers got, I would argue, got punished in ways that you couldn't really blame them for, right? Like we, we'll, we may get into this more, but like, how do you blame Starbucks, right? They, they had a, a, a brilliant model, but it was not what you would call a really COVID friendly model. So suddenly the digital darlings of the retail sector took it on the chin, right? But now I think maybe we're getting back into where we can start talking. Winners and losers isn't really the right language anymore because it's not fair and, and we all kind of have to help each other right now. But I think we can start to step back again and say, which retailers are really responding to this in in a in an effective way that is good for their employees and customers, right? I mean, isn't that what it's all about right now? Is to try to figure out what they're doing that's working. Hundred percent, yeah. And I, I've been really impressed by um, yeah the, the quick innovation that, that we've seen from retailers, whether that's you know getting into your home through use of technology, improving delivery, you know, driving things like social commerce, which we'll come on to as well. So I think. It's not only acting fast, but it's acting fast with with the value of the customer in mind. And there's there's innovation for innovation's sake, and the, and the successful innovation as well. So I think the amount that we've seen change so quickly, and the value that it's driven to customers, I think has been been astounding. I think there's probably a wider question as to 
did it take a pandemic for this innovation to really be accelerated or could it have been done anyway? But right. that's probably a longer question that we could discuss for hours on end. So we'll focus, yeah. on, the, we'll focus on the positives for now. Yeah. So, uh, and just a reminder, anyone watching, feel free to start posting questions and comments in the chat. We will be getting to as many of those as we can. Um, J Jake. So um, if you had to describe in a, in, in a, in a few sort of, ideas what are the biggest changes that you think we've seen from last year last year's retail market to this year one year into the pandemic so uh, yeah i i think we'll, we'll come on to kind of the the long-lasting impact of covid but but realistically i think what what has happened is the current state you are in whichever way you are whether you're declining or improving it has been exacerbated by the pandemic so those who were struggling and maybe, you know, dying a death of a thousand cuts have bled out a lot quicker than we ever imagined. So I think that's definitely something we've seen. And those that were strategically set up either, you know, with that e-commerce channel, with that uh, e-commerce experience and with those deliveries, they've succeeded and continue to innovate as a result. So, you know, when we were talking, obviously, John, about kind of in-store innovation, all that kind of stuff, it's hard to talk about that over the last year because particularly in the UK, non-essential retail has been closed for the best part of kind of eight or nine months over the last over the last year so that so those guys have really struggled and either if you haven't got an e-commerce channel set up or if you've had to set one up very quickly it's become very very messy and, and very kind of hyper competitive out there so uh yeah it, it's been a been a lot of headaches for retailers who haven't had that channel set up already um i'm sure many of us have been shouting about for a while of the importance of having not just a store channel but an e-commerce one as well and, and joining the two up but, but this year has proved that, yeah, having that single store channel and, and using stores purely as a sales platform in its purest sense, just that's just not sustainable anymore. Yeah, I, I sent you a few items. I actually got some fairly interesting and one fairly shocking item in my inbox from P, my retail PR contingent this week. And one of the ones that wasn't really the shocking one, but was still interesting, was this whole notion of like how – how do you do year over year store comparisons right now? Right. Like, so, you know, it's like, we're just making progress on retail metrics and now you kind of have to throw them out the window, right? Like you can't really do a comp on store performance year to year right now. That wouldn't be fair. No, no, not, not at all. Not if, it, not if it's not even been open this year for that month, it's hard to do a year on year comparison, but I think those, those traditional metrics of how you measure as performance of the store are also, also going to change completely because as you said, John, that vaccine economy and, and the uncertainty around what's going to happen in the next six to nine months, nobody knows if customers are going to flow back directly back to stores. And, you know, once everyone's got a vaccine, they're going to be pumped full of confidence to head back. I would imagine there's a bit of pent up demand out there. We certainly saw it here between the kind of first and second lockdown where people hadn't had a chance to go to those stores, but there's pent up demand and then the sustainable demand. And I'm just not sure we're ever going to get from the first to the second. And we're never really going to go back to that full store experience. So how you measure your store as yes, yeah, sales by square foot being the traditional metric. I'm just not sure that traditional metric maybe is, is realistic moving forward. Yeah. And I think one really interesting thing we, we got to last year was the importance of retail as a data platform, right? And that when we talk about experience and retail, which was like one of the hot words at last year's show, um, it's all about having the data to serve customers better. And now you think about like both the employee experience in retail and the customer experience, and you think about going ahead this year and that data is going to be a big issue, right? Because now you're thinking about things like, okay, so are we going to like, tell our customers that all of our in-store employees have been vaccinated, for example, like, are we going to require testing for certain access to certain parts of the store, for example, like, and, and some of this is really interesting because a lot of that data is very sensitive and regulated also. So it seems like if I had to pick one thing, there's going to be a lot of like data challenges around these retail experiences now. A hundred percent. And there's actually uh, rumors here of uh, no jab, no job contracts being offered um, mm -hmm. in retail and other organizations where literally they are saying that, yeah, employees must take a vac must must have the vaccine before they can return to work because of the safe environment that it provides. Now, I'm sure that is a, you know, a whole different conversation in terms of wider freedoms. But in terms of what that what that means for retail, like you said, there's there's data privacy issues there. There's, there's um, kind of COVID safety regulations. But in the bigger picture, it's 
how do we set up stores in a way that provide that safe environment and drive that confidence back to consumers and you know retailers will be thinking if, if one one element is we have a fully vaccinated workforce that is one way of driving that consumer confidence and you know pe people to you know mull about freely in stores again so i've no doubt it's it's, it's one of the considerations for for retailers uh, and Bill Wood has kind of a monster question. Bill, we may have to tackle your question in some chunks as we go. What are the big trends for retailers dealing with customer sentiment, simplicity, and automation? I'm sure we'll get back to a number of those topics. Is there anything that jumps out right now, Jake, on that one? Yeah, so I think customer sentiment's a massive one, and we'll come on to things like social commerce, but you, you know, we've all heard the stats around kind of millennials and Gen Z, and, and you know, they're going to start taking up over 50% of purchasing power in the in the US and the UK. Those generations are, you know, glued to their mobile phones, I'm sure to the irritation of, of parents all over all over the world. But what that means is that they share their thoughts, they share their, you know, their experiences all over social media, which is which is great because you know there's opinion of brands out there. But in terms of customer sentiment, there's a lot of analysis you need to be doing in that space to really understand what your customers are saying about you. You know, not often do they just pick up the phone to complain on customer service. Now it's a tweet. The post on Facebook, it's an Instagram post. So there has to be a wealth of different tools and, and metrics you have to use to understand your customer sentiment analysis and, and really make actionable feedback off the back of it. There's one point understanding the feedback. There's another thing actually, you know, segmenting that and really understanding what to do with it. So there's a big piece there that, uh, that we can digest for sure. Yeah. Um, and Thomas is saying employee experience versus customer experience in store is always a good point to discuss. Yeah. And Thomas, we'll probably get into that a little more. I think one of the interesting challenges is how much should it be discussed right now in terms of um, should retailers be spending a lot of time uh, on, on in-store or, or not? I mean, and that's one of the questions, million dollar questions for this year. Um, we'll get into some data on, on consumer sentiment on that, but I think it's a complicated, a complicated question. Um, and then Thomas also asks you, Jake, is it social commerce or commerce anywhere? Oh, it's, it's a good question. And, and maybe, the, maybe, the, maybe the two are interlinked and we'll definitely get into to social commerce. I think there's a wider, there was a wider piece about social commerce that isn't necessarily just this kind of commerce anywhere. For me, commerce anywhere is obviously what it says on the tin of being able to interact and, and purchase or, or view goods from, from retailers wherever you are and, and provide that kind of consistent seamless, if you want to use the buzzword, and frictionless experience across channels. Social commerce is, is a slightly different entity, in my opinion, because, again, going back to kind of those Gen Z and millennials, and I only harp on about them because of the purchasing power that they, that they have, but actually for a lot of them, it's shopping with friends and shopping in that community feel, which isn't just shopping, isn't just um, social anywhere. So there's, there's already startups in, in Asia, people like obviously Alibaba are streets ahead in terms of that live commerce and the stats around their singles day are, are mind blowing. But there's actually apps out there already. I think it's called Pin Duo Duo, which offers group discounts for shopping with your friends. So it's really trying to encourage that group shopping online to try and replicate that in-store experience of kids walking around malls or department stores or shops in big groups because that's what they appreciate doing and they get positive reinforcement from their friends. How do you recreate that online? And that's through social commerce, which in Asia is streets ahead to where we are, particularly in the UK and, and probably the US as well. So I think that's the, I guess, the nuance of social commerce compared to that social anywhere, in my opinion. In just a minute, we're going to get into uh, Jake's countdown of top five uh, retail misconceptions. And he has a prop as well, which is great. We got some visual <laughs> props this week. Uh, one more thing I wanted to get into with you, Jake, before we do that is I, I think there's a, there's a couple of really fascinating trends. I mean, one is kind of obvious, I think, which is that that brand loyalty is really there's a big wrench been thrown in brand loyalty in a sense, because so much of COVID was about figuring out the best way to get the stuff you wanted. And if your brand was out of stock on a supermarket shelf, or if you get a different brand online, you switched. So I think brand loyalty definitely took a hit. That's one thing that really comes to mind. The other thing I think is really interesting is like, if you're a retailer and your product was in demand, then all you really had to do was to figure out how to deliver it to consumers or in, or in store pickup or whatever you know so called safer options. That's a hard problem maybe to figure out whether you want to play with Amazon or do some other. But the point is, it's a solvable problem. The demand is there. I'm fascinated by some of the retail segments where the demand started to dry up, 
and they had to literally reinvent their business models, right? So you think about certain luxury brands where people are used to going in store before to try something on an expensive watch or whatever. And now suddenly you're thinking about, well, how, how, what do we do? And, and I think that's really interesting because some of those brands are perhaps driving what you might call innovation around things like VR and AR and, you know, trying stuff on like, you know, in a virtual way or whatever. So I think it's really interesting to look at some of those brands where the demand wasn't so high and what did they do, you know? Yeah, and, and it actually comes back to that employee experience point and actually the role of the in-store associate because before it was, you know, go and pick something from the back or, you know, where, where can I find this? Now it's actually really in that salesperson role. And there's actually a company called Hero run by a chap called Adam Levine that actually connects the um, individual shopping on their mobile or, or kind of um, tablet, anything like that, with that in-store associate to really provide that in-store experience. You're not just chatting to a customer service agent or, you know, our favorite chatbot, but actually an in-store associate, an expert in the product who can talk you through it. So they're really trying to replicate that in-store experience online because, yeah, like we said before, John, going to buy, you know, a luxury watch or a luxury handbag, spending $5,000, $6,000, you know, not, more often than not, you're going to want to go and see that, feel it and talk to an expert about it. At least with things like Hero and, and, and similar similar startups, you can at least engage with those experts and have that conversation as well. And there's all sorts of great initiatives already around that AR and VR and, and things like that. I think IKEA is, is, is a massive one. So being able to, you can place that sofa in your home on your mobile device, see what it looks like, do all the measurements, things like that. Again, trying to bring the technology into your home. And again, the, the other one in, the, in that sector is, is, is beauty, which is people like L'Oreal as well. So uh, probably not for me and you, John, but how you can try makeup on and, and see check your style on your face and get the right shade for your skin. All those different things, again, that traditionally you go to a beauty hall, to a Sephora to try on. How do you do that and, and have the confidence to make, you know, it's a purchase of $40, $50. You know, it's still a sizable amount of money. How do you have the confidence to do that in the safety of your own home and that through that innovation as well? Yep. All right. Well, let's let's go through some of your misconceptions. I'm going to change the camera view so people can see it okay. better. Um, Jake's going to hold hold a couple of these up. If you can't quite see him, he's going to read them for you as well. I so will. so so uh, pick pick the pick one of the misconceptions for us. Okay. We'll start. We'll start from the bottom. Um, okay. Okay. So number one is personalization is the only way to success. So okay. I know personalization is a huge buzzword out there and. I'm never going to challenge that it is, of course, a huge component and a value add to the customer experience. But for me, it's definitely not the silver bullet that, that some people make it out to be. You know, we talk about the, that huge amount of data, the AI that can obviously process data and provide insights quicker than, you know, any, any human can. But for me, there's a lot of other elements to a successful customer experience. We talk about things like convenience and speed and ease of purchase. Again, go back to those buzzwords of frictionless and seamless but for me they are just as important as personalization you can have the most personalized experience and you know get that size that you're looking for and that recommendation all that good stuff if it takes me 15 clicks to get there it has a hidden shipping cost at the end and it's actually going to take 15 days to get to me then the personalization is entirely irrelevant so not going to argue that it's definitely important but i i feel that there's a lot of other different components to a successful customer experience and that maybe sometimes personalization is is slightly over in its importance because there's a lot of other barriers to a customer experience. I'm actually going to use a sound effect for that one, Jake, because you just made my day. <laughs> so we're going to give you the applause here. There. <laughs> I'll take I think, it. I think that was worth the price of admission right there. I mean, I, I've been writing about hyper-personalization on, on my blog of late. Uh, feel free to check that on Diginomica. But, but I, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the other things I would add with personalization is that I don't think the tech is generally there yet uh, for a lot of the scenarios it is for some i mean obviously like like some of the stuff with amazon and netflix or youtube where they're really good at showing you related stuff okay fine um but in general i think companies overreach with personalization and they think they know me a lot better than they do right so you know i i just bought you know the last piece of luggage i'm going to need for a long time I've been seeing luggage ever since and you know not only is that not helpful but it actually makes me less impressed with you. It makes me less trustful of you. So I think that's the other thing I would add about personalization is it's not even like broadly achieved yet in a satisfactory manner, in my opinion. So yeah, it, it can be clumsy. It can sometimes be a bit over invasive as well. And it's, it's a real fine balance. So yeah, definitely other things to focus on in my opinion. 
Uh, Thomas, you, you said frictionless is a good one. Frictionless po process or frictionless experience. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, frictionless is, a, is one of those terms that I use with some caution though, to be fair, Diginomica has a frictionless enterprise model. So we have jumped in on that. Um, I view it as aspirational, but I think it is interesting to think about where the weak links are. And one thing about the COVID economy is I think it's exposed some of the weak links right? Like in ways that we didn't quite realize because in the past, if I had to go in and swipe a credit card, maybe that wasn't a big deal, but maybe it is now. I mean, Europe is a lot further ahead with hands-free payment tech than the US. And that's an example of something that really got exposed where it was like, well, it's no big deal to hand my card over. Well, suddenly it's kind of a big deal, you know? So I think it's interesting how that happens. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and yeah, I think that the Again, I'm trying to answer Thomas's question now. I feel like frictionless process underpins the frictionless experience. So I'm intrigued by the number of clicks it takes to make a purchase on a website, why you abandon your basket, how you make sure the customer has the right information before they get to that purchasing decision. All those different things are really, really intriguing to understand that customer journey. And some people want to browse and get inspiration and choose different products. Other people know what they want, know when they want it and want to go and achieve that. And you have to be able to accommodate for both. Indeed. All right. Let's see your next one. Let's do number okay. four. Number four. There we go. So store and e-commerce sales will rebalance after the pandemic. So again, mm. I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of thought out there around how, uh, yeah, stores still have parts play, which I completely agree that they do. And that maybe e-commerce isn't quite ready for ready for the kind of dominance that I think we'll see in a few years. I, would, would disagree with that and I'm sure some other people will as well and I think certainly what we've seen in the pandemic is people have been forced to shop online whether that's your groceries whether that's your clothes etc and people who were maybe reticent about technology before maybe had some misconceptions about it have actually found it is a bit easier and to have something delivered to your door and actually using that technology is great you know who'd have thought we'd have 60 70 80 year olds on zoom calls and skype calls and you know I'm sure it was a bit dodgy to begin with but even they've realized that this technology is easy to use. So I think that shift has been accelerated by COVID. And I think we, you know, we'll get that return to stores a little bit, but I think that econ e swing is here to stay. And I think in January, the, the retail sales in the UK just came out and, and econ is now a, a, a third of all, all, all sales in the UK now. So I think it, it, it might drop again, but you know, we were looking at kind of eight to 12% before the pandemic. And you can see where it's gone now. And, and, I, and I feel like it's gonna stick because I think people have realized the convenience and the ease of shopping online. Um, I, and really seen the benefits, particularly people who haven't used it before. Jake, you know what the other thing too is I think like what has been underestimated by some is just the length of time this has gone on has really enforced habits, right? So like, like I was someone who never used delivery or pickup stuff for groceries and I, I'm just a roam the store kind of a guy that I, I, I like doing it. I don't find it inconvenient, but, um, I went shopping for the last time, I think last March in a store. And um, I, I just got creeped out by the whole experience, like seeing empty shelves freaked me out the way people were behaving. Um, these weird lines people had to go through. And of course that's gotten more strict. And, and then I think I caught some nasty bug that day that wasn't COVID, but, um, but I was like the hell with this. But, you know, the first few months ordering and delivering was a little bit choppy for me. There were a lot of glitches. But as I worked it out and as the services got better, I got more used to it. And, and I started to think like, yeah, maybe that's a permanent habit for me. I don't know. But that has enormous implications, right, for retailers, especially when you consider that my grocery bill has dropped. Now, I don't know if that's true for everyone who orders delivery, but I do think there's a stumble factor shopping in person, right? And so you have to think about, well, how do you duplicate the stumble factor and how do you make that happen in a way where I could just throw stuff in my cart? I think it's really interesting how the length of time of this pandemic has, I think, really changed this conversation. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's, and it's the shopping online with grocers, but there's also kind of the, the DIY meal kits as well. I never thought, you know, my parents right. now order a, a weekly box and it comes with the recipes prepared and they make it themselves. Yeah, and yeah. My, my dad's cooking for the first time in 30 years and you never thought you'd see it, but they've realized the technology's there. It's easy to do. It lands on the doorstep. It's all there. So why wouldn't you? And, and like you said, John, people are at different starting points. You know, I 
now get my groceries delivered through a cardo nine o'clock every Sunday morning and have them for last year and it lands on my doorstep and I know what I'm getting and it's perfect. Whereas you, right. you know, you are maybe a slower adopter, but you're starting to see the benefits as well. So all got yeah. different starting points, but I feel like it's all heading in, in the same direction. Ouch, your friction with experience is not memorable, isn't it, says Thomas. I, you know, I Thomas, I, perhaps, but I, I think over time, if you accumulate frictionless experiences i think that's good for your for your brand i think the because i think what is memorable is a non-frictionless experience a, a wildly inconvenient experience so that'd be my answer to that it depends what you're looking for as well you know if you're looking if you know what right. you're getting and you know what you're going for and, and that's that frictionless you know amazon i i might order the same product you know a couple of times some some breakfast bars protein bars things like that i go on there i click that buy it now option i've clicked twice and it's on my doorstep the next day so that, that's memorable for me for sure <laughs> yeah there you go yeah yeah I, I remember the first time i accidentally ordered some i was ordering like some walnuts or something and suddenly it was my local whole food whole foods was integrated and i wasn't even planning on that but then like two hours later i had groceries which was unheard of and so <laughs> you know like like that that was like memorable but okay might have lost john for a second there I'll, I'll I'll see if I can answer your your question. In the meantime, I think John might have uh, accidentally clicked the wrong button. So Bill, uh, until oh John's back. There we go. But uh, I was just reading out Bill's. Uh, Bill's yeah, question. yeah. Go ahead. Until COVID, there was a steady trend towards mass customization. And although far away, it's been trending. Whether it's a personalized customer experience or a tailored good or service, how has this been impacted by COVID? Well, your I, answer. I, yeah. So I mean. There's, there's the, that trend's not going away. That mass customization, and uh, particularly in that in the e-commerce space, as we said, those retailers who are you know bricks and mortar pure plays are now moving online, which means that online experience is even more competitive. What I would say is there are multiple ways to customize that experience and be personalized. It's not necessarily just through recommendations, which I think is you know sometimes a bit of a a bit of a trap sometimes it's not just through personalized recommendations it might be understanding where people want to get it delivered whether it's you know a click and collect whether it's the right size there's a lot of different ways to drive that personalization rather than just through through recommendations so i think it's still moving in that direction uh, and i still think it's a massively important thing particularly as things like e-com are even more competitive after the pandemic mm. all right let's see your uh, third retail misconception there okay no problem so the high street and malls are dead. So the high street, which is obviously kind of your more traditional uh, UK high street in your leafy, leafy suburbs, not necessarily in London, um, definitely have suffered. Obviously, those kind of much smaller retailers without that econ presence and without those, you know, those huge fulfillment centers that have certainly struggled. And obviously those malls, you know, John, I always think of, of Hudson Yards and visiting that last year and just being overawed at the sheer size and, and scale of it and just imagining that being an absolute ghost town for the last 12 months as well. What I would say is in their current forms, I feel like they will always struggle, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're dead. It means they will evolve. So I'll take high streets as the first instance. In the UK particularly, and you, you can back me up if it's the same in the US, John, there's definitely that shop local and shop independent and support your local independent retailers, a bit of a movement around that in the UK. So things like high streets, I think we'll always have a place for that. But I think for high streets, it's about thinking what that community needs. So wh what is that destination and why would you go to that high street? Is it for the gyms, the restaurants, the bars? You know, what are those different partnerships and retailers can almost provide that experience for people that isn't just about going to purely buy something. Actually, the purchasing should be incidental based on the overall destination of the place. So I think that's really interesting because I think High streets in their current format might be struggling, but they're definitely not dead because they'll change. And I think malls are the same. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, John, because I know Hudson Yards, you know, I remember seeing there was a co-working space there. There was Camp, which was the kids retailers. There's the little, the Mercado Little Spain downstairs, which all feel like destinations. But at the same time, there's, you know, there's a lot of square footage going to big retailers as well. So again, I see that as uh, shifting to a destination and you've got to share that square footage. I wonder whether maybe more than that size that are really going to struggle to really fill that space and, you know, still become a destination, but still be able to pay the, you know, the mortgage and the bills at the end of the month as well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I tend to agree with your misconception though. I do think that 
that there there's certain malls that are just cursed based on their location and 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 demographics and stuff and they're they're going to have to just close down and we've seen some of that um but i think it's really more that certain retailers with heavy mall presence could be in trouble and and we've seen some of them go bankrupt and of course bankruptcy doesn't mean the end in retail but you know like is like toys rs finally done now i was still waiting <laughs> um but um but I, one thing i noticed before the pandemic when i was at my local mall which i don't go to that often is i noticed a whole lot more stores that seem to be more about quote unquote experiences if you will um like massage places, dental places, gyms, you know, it seemed like there was a more of a mix, right. Of like, yeah, you can go pick up your sh shoes, which of course shoe stores are always going to be a mainstay of a mall. Right. But, but, but then also these other things where you could, there's like a virtual reality thing where you could like ride roller coasters and stuff. And um, that was a pretty fun one because I wanted to do like this dinosaur uh, virtual ride. And the, this woman, she was about a 70 year old woman. She was like, that's for babies. Um, so I, so then she gave me this different one, but the point is like, there were all these like virtual things. I was like, okay, like, like this is sort of a mall, sort of a rethink of the mall. Right. Yeah. Or, or, or maybe like if you're a big storefront, maybe it becomes like two thirds warehouse. Right. So, and, and then you have a pickup center and then, you know what I mean? So maybe you just rethink the space. Yeah, hundred percent, and I, I think we'll get onto the role of the store in, in one of the lessons. So I won't spoil the surprise, but I okay. think there's a lot you can do in terms of, like we said, those traditional metrics of kind of sales per square foot. What else can that store do? Which I think is the yeah, it's a good conversation we'll come on to for sure. Yep. Okay. Um, Bill asks again, how does the personalized experience or tailored online experience impact configure price quote technology? Are you seeing CPQ needs increase, decrease, or stay the same? That's some hardcore enterprise chops there, Bill, on CPQ, because CPQ is definitely a big deal uh, in enterprise level conversations. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's I think it's a really tricky one. I think it's retailer dependent. So I think again, it's kind of understanding what that e-commerce experience you're trying to offer, whether it is to inspire or whether it is that real quick purchase journey. And I think that'll inform that CPQ technology in play. Uh, and Thomas, I don't know, maybe you typed this while I was talking. Isn't there a longer trend for malls to include experience-like type businesses? I don't know. Evidently so, based on my experiences of being told I was a baby from wanting to take a, a, a dinosaur virtual reality ride. I would, I would say, yeah, there probably is. <laughs> I think, I think I, again, I think it's dialing it back to the customer, right? So what is, you know, either one of ourselves or, you know, a family of four or an elderly couple, what do they want to do on the weekend? Do they want to go... For a nice lunch and, and you know do some shopping afterwards do you want to go to the bars do you want to go to the gym do you want to go to the cinema what it, what are those purposes on a saturday that means they're going to go to that destination and as i said before uh, the purchasing should be a coincidental factor of that not the main driver of it and it's about getting people there through that destination format and then retail is incidental off the side of it in my opinion indeed okay let's see your number two number two here we go i'm sure there'll be some discussion about this one COVID transformed retail. Ah, okay. That's a misconception in your book. Interesting. In my, in my opinion. Again, okay. I'll caveat that every single time. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, it, it, in, in my opinion, yeah, I think the effects of the pandemic are purely an acceleration of where we would be anyway in about eight to 10 years time. So COVID has accelerated it for sure. And, and, like we said before, in terms of the innovation, in terms of the product roadmaps, I'm sure retailers had that they've, you know, reined in by five years. It's all been accelerated, but I don't see any maybe long-term lasting effects of the pandemic that wouldn't have been seen by transformation from retail anyway. It's just happened in 2021, not 2028, 2030. So as I said before, things like retailers that were struggling, big department stores, your JC Penney's, your Sears, you know, I'm not sure it takes a genius to work out that those guys were struggling because a lot of square foot there products weren't well merchandised wasn't a great place to spend time or browse you know the covid that you can't blame covid on that that's that's just the way your store was being set up on the other hand retailers who have adapted quickly who had that e-commerce well set up who had efficient delivery all those kind of things they've thrived and again that's not thanks to covid that's because they thought about their digital channels they've been able to act with agility and adapt to new circumstances to roll out new products and services to customers quickly. And again, I think that's that's because of the well-placed 
they were either before the pandemic or how they've adapted because of it and, and adapted with agility. So, yeah, I would argue that COVID has accelerated it, but it hasn't transformed retail on its own. Thomas, who, by the way, is a CX analyst of note with his own show, CRM Convos, uh, which is well worth a view, uh, says COVID finally brought them to the starting line. So I think he's essentially agreeing uh, with you there. 100%. Um, Yeah, it it is an interesting thing. You know, I'm going to largely agree with you also, though. I think I would probably put a little bit of a, 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 a caveat there, which is I agree with you if people's behavior goes back to normal in the sense that if they, if, if, if let's say three or four years from now, let's be generous on the time frame, that people no longer make choices based on either safety or inconveniences based on safety. In other words, I'm safe, but I have to wear a mask that could affect my decision as to whether I'm going to go hang out somewhere if I don't feel like masking up, for example. So the example I would give you would be something like a Starbucks where historically what they were trying to do is they were trying to create spaces that were kind of home away from home kind of vibe where you would go hang out. And I thought it brilliantly anticipated a little bit of the flexible work trends that we're seeing. But if I don't, if I don't feel like, like safe, I think that artificially excludes my decision to go there. So that needs to get retested once I feel totally comfortable. And then let's see if I go to Starbucks like I used to and hang out for the afternoon or not, or if my behavior adapts. So I think there are some exceptions to that based on things like that, that are more like hangout type spaces and stuff like, um, but in general, I think especially the, what you're describing in terms of the disruption of the large chains and stuff, I think you're totally right. Um, and, and, and the acceleration of VR technology referred to like that was coming anyway, right? This COVID just put like a huge, like momentum behind it. So I think 100%. you're mostly right there. Yeah. hundred percent. And I think again, things like social commerce, buying through Instagram, buying through Facebook, those things were coming. It's just the fact that, you know, now we've all been sat on our sofas on our phones. So it's just come a lot quicker than it was going to. So again, yep. I think that's, that's a really good example of where, you know, that one click buy on, on, on Instagram and you don't even have to go through to the retailer um, website anymore. That was on its way. It's just Instagram saw the, you know, the traffic and how much time we were spending on our phones during the middle of lockdown. And they brought that forward. And, and that's why that's, you know, a mainstay now. Absolutely. Okay, uh, let's see your number one. Okay, number one. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Ah, uh, yeah. There's a good one for you. Amazon, Amazon destroyed, destroyed retail. Okay, Amazon destroyed retail. Okay. And it did not. No, it, again, in my opinion, Amazon did not destroy retail. And I know there are lots of stories out there about small companies that have struggled against Amazon. And I, I fully understand that. And lots of things around trademarks and things like that. On the flip side of that, Amazon Marketplace and the ability to sell your products through Amazon, they, according to Amazon themselves, has created 900,000 retail jobs through the ability to, to do that. And you think about the ability of being able to get to Amazon's customer reach, the delivery becoming Amazon's headache, all those different benefits for small businesses, I think, are massive. And then for those larger retailers as well, Amazon hasn't destroyed retail. It's set the standard for new retail in terms of how you serve customers, how you run an e-commerce platform how you provide, you know, next day delivery, Prime Now, within an hour, I think is, you know, is is here already. And in terms of the assortment and the range available, they have set the new standard for that. So yes, of course, people have, have been put up, you know, struggled in, and, and fallen behind Amazon, but that's because the bar's been set so much higher by them. So I, I think it's unfair to say that they've destroyed retail. Understand there's some caveats of that further down the chain. But I think in general, in terms of how to, you know, adapt, move into new industries, continue to innovate, you know, these drone deliveries that we hear so much about, whether they're on their way or not, they've set the standard for, for new retail. And I think that's the, that's the important thing for me. You know, what's really interesting is I, I think it's going to, I'm going to be fascinated to see if Amazon can own the so-called last mile space of logistics and, and getting the product directly to you. Like, like, and, and I, I'm, I'm being a little bit anecdotal here cause I don't know for sure, but like in my town, for example, Amazon started doing a lot of deliveries that used to be done by UPS and FedEx um, and essentially have been fairly unprofessional about it in the sense that it's a gig economy setup. These are not like experienced delivery drivers that have years of experience on routes and know what they're doing. These are people who are paid on volume. Like, oh, uh, I, I had one person who like deliberately 
canceled the delivery on Amazon because I had said I wasn't available and they were supposed to drop it off at my office location, but they needed the metric on their number. So they canceled and said I wasn't available. And then I had to reorder and just stupid crap like that. Um, and, and it made me feel like there's room for uh, some comp competitors around a better last mile experience. I mean, granted, it doesn't always matter if, if it's, if your house is easy to find and drop off, but like, especially with like, Oh, I can go to your house and maybe install a product and maybe even give you advice on your fitness routine. Now, now last week, Laura Sarah, supply chain expert told me she had a really good last mile experience with a third party that Amazon outsourced to. So maybe Amazon can do it. But I think to me, that's an interesting aspect because I think their last mile gig economy delivery, that's not the ultimate employee experience the way they're driving those people by volume metrics. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I it's completely the same here. That gig economy. I think the stat I was reading the other day. I think they have to make two hundred and fifty deliveries a day. Which, if you think about the different addresses and stuff, and it's not like a postman who has his normal round. That's that's some exactly. serious metrics they've got to get to. And the stories of you know people speeding and and all sorts to try and get there. Yeah, which which isn't right. And I forget the name, but there is all, there's already kind of fashion retailers in the space who actually the delivery individual will wait at your door whilst you try on the clothes. And then take back straight away any clothes that you that you don't like already, and you know that's next level last mile delivery in terms of that customer service. Obviously helps your retail returns model as well because you know what's coming back to you comes back right. to you nice and quickly. But also in terms of that customer service, I think is it, excellent. And like you said, transforming the role of that employee to leaving a parcel on your door to you know sales associate, which I think is yeah really interesting. So I think the way to kind of think about it in my mind, it's not so much that Amazon destroyed retail, though I think there have certainly been casualties, but but more that Amazon creates a pretty clear parameter and you probably shouldn't compete directly with them. You should figure out how to do something different than them, like like you just described, where it's like, yeah, I'll wait. Wait, wait, are you saying you'll wait for me outside while I tr try on my clothes? <laughs> yes, I will. I mean, that's pretty awesome. And to your point, like from a returns perspective, that can actually be, be a, a pretty valuable thing to do just because returns are so expensive for retailers and stuff. So yeah, that, that visibility is yeah. Amazing. And like you said, that returns headache is, is always a nightmare. So yeah, definitely, definitely a big opportunity. Yeah. And what a LinkedIn user visits a lot says his daughter will love the new returns <laughs> model. Absolutely. Dude. She'll, she'll wait while you try that on. You'll probably love it too. Instead of having <laughs> to buy all those extra clothes. So I hear you there. Um, and then, and Thomas brings up the drones, right? So like, uh, again, I, I, you know, the drones are sort of one step beyond the, the gig economy, perhaps of delivery, but it's the same concept, which is a very impersonal type of service that will be highly efficient for certain things and then highly problematic for others, I think. so. A hundred percent. And it's the same with the autonomous robot delivery as well. You know, things like that, again, really interesting. And like you said, that, you know, that gig economy going to that. But, you know, I don't think you could get less personalized than a robot turning up your door that doesn't even say good morning to you. So, again, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, uh, it's a toss up between the two. Yeah. Do you tip your robot? <laughs> Pro probably not. Well, exactly. well, those, uh, those top five misconceptions were really interesting. And if you, if you guys are in the chat and you missed some of them, be sure to catch the replay. I think Jake really, really did an awesome job there. Um, but in the spirit of, of this show, we don't just like to, to snark on things. We want to kind of have a look at what's actually working as well. So Jake has yeah. one more uh, list to present to us. And this is going to be, um, sort of top five, sort of what tips for successful retailers. Is that how we framed it or? Yeah. Lessons, tips for success. Exactly. So I'll okay. kick off again with, with number five, we'll work up to the, uh, to the big okay. one. So, Oh, there we go. Think um, partnerships. So again, when we, John, when we talk about things like innovation, and I know it's a very scary word, and you know, people out there think that it requires a lot of investment, a lot of time, and a lot of effort. One way around that is is through partnerships. It's a really easy way to either gain gain access to a new market segment, a new technology, somebody who's already got the scale and reach that you you know might take two or three years to build that. So having an effective partnership strategy, I think, is really important. So. One in the UK is, is, is a great example is Deliveroo, so the, the food delivery company, uh, a grocer called The Co-op, which is one of, one of the big four grocers, now offers grocery service through, through Deliveroo. So you can get your groceries delivered in, in the kind of anything from 20, 20 minutes to 45 minutes. And for somebody who doesn't have an established grocery delivery model like the Tesco's, the Sainsbury's, the Ocado's, that takes years to build those things in terms of the fulfillment models, the vans, the infrastructure, et cetera, 
get that partnership. Of course, it costs you a few bob in return, but you've automatically got the scale and the reach. And also someone like Deliveroo that has a great brand perception in the UK and the reach of those customers is a great example of a partnership. And I know Walmart do the same in uh, in China with JD.com as well. So you can either buy Walmart through WeChat or you can buy it through JD's e-commerce platform as well. So yeah, I know, I know there's a bit of front up cost there, but you've got to, again, the trade off between investing in innovation, waiting two or three years for it to be established versus, you know, that immediate impact and, and, and really strong partnership model. So I think uh, considering partnerships as a, as a way to innovate without investing yourself into your own model, I think is, is a really interesting one. Yeah, you know, and it strikes me, especially when it when it comes to sort of getting on new platforms, you're going to need that, right? Because like, it, it wouldn't be fair if only the biggest brands were the ones that were available on like the Facebook chat, right? Or, or, or WeChat, or you, you want to be available on those platforms also. And so probably there'll be brokers that provide that to smaller businesses and they'll want to take their cut, but retailers are going to have to suck that up just like they deal with it now. 100%. It's exactly that. Yes, yeah, that cost benefit analysis between the two. But, you know, if you do that right, you can really, uh, you know, get an effective partnership where you need it. Got it. Okay. Let's see number four. Good stuff. Okay. And I'm sure this, I know this is a phrase that Diginomica have used before, so you'll definitely recognize it. Test and learn, test and learn, and test and learn. So, mm. again, innovation every single time is not going to be, you know, the silver bullet, the 10 out of 10, the knockout punch that you need it to be. That's not the, that's not what innovation is about. Innovation is about testing things, learning and failing fast if you need to as well. And it's not mm. just about, you know, f- failure isn't just, you know, we've lost a load of money. It's the learnings off the back of it. It's the data, it's the insights and it's the improvement through it as well. So I think test and learning in, in your innovation approach is massively important. And I know this is something that your, your colleagues in Diginomica have spoken about, but that really requires executive and particularly kind of your, your CFO buy-in because it needs a almost a, a pot of budget to be able to do that. It can't just be, you know, here's your budget. I want you to deliver ROI on that because that's not what innovation is about. Innovation is about pushing the boundaries and learning from your mistakes to drive that continuous improvement. So I think test mm-hmm. and learn is massive, particularly nowadays, John, when we are so uncertain about the, what, what the next six months look like. It's hard to nail your colors to the flag about what customers are going to feel and, and do in six months, whether we are wearing masks, whether we are wanting to go into stores all those different things. So be able to test and learn and try different new things along the way means you can still make progress whilst there's still uncertainty. So test and learn is a culture problem. Um, To some extent, it's also a technology problem too, right? Because some some technical architectures just aren't compatible with that speed of of updating. So it creates some interesting uh, crossroads for decision makers there. Yeah, and I think one really interesting example when I was doing some homework on this, which I find incredible, is, is tractor supply company. So they do they, their numbers speak for themselves. I think they've kind of almost doubled revenue in the last five years, which I think is incredible. And they've driven this outstanding customer loyalty program. But their customer loyalty program wasn't big bang. This was a slowly iterative approach that took years to finally tune with the data and insights they were gaining. So it's a really great example of, you know, a really successful retailer in what is arguably, you know, one of the niche sectors, particularly, you know, in the UK. But mm. it's a great example of where they've tested, learned, grown incrementally into something that, you know, is a really fundamental part of their business now. Yeah, that's a great example, too, because I wouldn't, tractors would have been the first thing that came to mind for me. <laughs> um, can I ask you as a little bit of a diversion before we get to your next one? Um are, are you seeing any effective, what you would call effective use of, of, of chatbots? I'm as part of these strategies, I, I, I've yet to really have, I think, really meaningfully good experiences interacting with bots on like websites and such, uh, either for service or sales. Have you found any useful scenarios yet? So I, I, I do see a need for chatbots, but I feel like there has to be understanding of where the limit of a chatbot is. And I feel like sometimes retailers try and push the boundary too far. And I feel like what, what, where a chatbot is effective is redirecting the query in the right direction, first of all. And I think that's where they can be used really well. So things like Facebook Messenger, a lot of retailers will interact with that where it might not be a customer service agent, but it's a chatbot. But what they will do is redirect your um, query in the right direction if it can't help you with the basic things. So things like mm. order number lookups, things like that is great. But where it, where it can redirect your query to the most effective person, that's where it works really well, in my opinion. So I think understanding the limit of your chatbot and how far it can go, I think is great. Where I have seen um, almost a chatbot is that voice recognition when you when you phone in. So particularly mm. kind of it, not necessarily in retail, but in financial services institutions, you know, you phone up and you say, what 
you know, what are you looking for help with today? I've actually seen that voice recognition, you know, I'm sure there's funny stories of, sorry, sir, what did you say <laughs> from previous yeah, yeah, days yeah. before? But actually now that's actually working a lot better as well in terms of, again, mm. having that experience, capturing those first bits of customer insight before then redirecting them to the right person. So that's a good example of where it, where it does seem to be improving. Got it. Okay, let's see the next on your list. Okay. This might be a bit more uh, buzzwordy for you, John, but we'll see uh, Uh-oh. We'll see what you think. Yeah. <laughs> so strategic transformation is still possible. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Get ready for strategic <laughs> transformation. So what do you yeah. mean by strategic transformation then? So by strategic transformation, I mean working towards a long-term goal or strategy whilst through whether that's a transformation project or through a transformation program. Now, before COVID, I still thought the theory of, you know, three to five year transformation programs were a thing of the past. COVID has certainly proven that now, given the uncertainty of, of where we're heading in the next 12 months, launching these massive three to five year transformation programs just aren't sustainable. But certainly something we've been doing at BGSF in the, in the last kind of six months or so is still helping retailers with the strategy of how do we deliver short term, incremental, iterative growth in a safer environment that's still trying to achieve that strategic vision. And I think there's there's a real um, way of doing that. We're starting to find out agile is at its core, in my opinion. So really those short-term learning development cycles are really important in that way. But there's still a way that you can do that in a way that you can you know, change direction. I'm not going to use the word pivot because I know you don't like it. Change direction, <laughs> change direction in, in short terms as and when, you know, customer behaviors change, the environment changes, circumstances change, but you're still heading towards that strategic vision or goal. Because I think without doing that, you, you you are just kind of you know treading water and not making any any advancements, which is which is not sustainable. Yeah, thanks thanks for not overdoing it on the word on the word pivot there. I appreciate <laughs> appreciate your consideration there. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I I, I tend to ag- uh, agree with agree with you, especially in the context of your previous um, remark because you took the position that in the long run these transformations were going to happen regardless of COVID. So if you kind of take that on deck, that we're still we're essentially accelerating towards the same approach, then why not be strategic about that? Right. Um, and, and, and in my mind, to your point, what, what is necessary, however, is much more like, I think the big problem with these long transformation initiatives in the past were there wasn't nearly enough focus on this notion of continuous improvement and delivery, either technically making that possible from a technical architecture standpoint or from a customer service standpoint or anything else, because like there has to be some quick wins along the way. And I think that's really what, what got neglected. Right. So I might be building a a bigger platform, um, but I might be redoing my whole website, but I better have a, a mobile app out there right now where I can add features every week and where I can enhance the experience constantly and where I can point to, growth of market share constantly you know so i think to me that's the balance is how can you do both 100 percent, and it's you could almost argue that actually the, those transformation programs shouldn't be happening at all and you should be in a constant state of improving and you know that agility and you know looking for the next thing and, and testing the next thing and it's not just we are now on this transformation program for the next three years and at the end of these three years we'll have achieved this it's actually you know what we are in a constant state of evolving and responding to customer requirements and the change in environments and the change in lockdowns and that's how we operate as a company moving forward which is in terms of uncertainty obviously you know a massive headache for for c-suites and, and cfos but at the same time, that's what's going to make you most adaptable and most agile to those changing circumstances and therefore most successful. So in the beginning of this, we talked a little bit about this notion of the vaccine economy we've been talking about on Diginomica, where, where there's a new economy that coming or that we're kind of stepping into that's not a return to normal, um, but there are some encouraging signs, but it invokes additional sort of safety concerns and and, 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 and data, data concerns that have to come along with that as far as making people feel safe, but respecting their data. Um, is, is that similar to how you look at this year? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, you know, that, that, again, that data privacy and that kind of safety theme trans, transfers the whole of retail, whether that's kind of your in-store, whether that's your personal data. And that's something that's really, really important to people moving forward. So retailers are going to have to be very 
honest, open and transparent for all elements of safety, whether that's in store, whether that's what they do with your data. Obviously, we've seen the change in how cookies are operated and I'm sure we're all annoyed by having to click accept all or reject all every time you go on a new website. Mm -hmm. But all that kind of transparency has to come through and customers now will relate to people who they share the same values with. And whether that's honesty, whether that's transparency and security, that's how, if there is still brand loyalty out there, that's how you will obtain it. Mm. Okay. All right. Let's see your next one. Number two. Here we go. So it's something we've touched on a little bit, but rethinking the role of the store. So like I said at the, at the beginning, John, those traditional metrics of kind of sales per square foot, I think are, are a thing of the past and and just kind of measuring the stores on the number of products you sell to the customers that walk in. I just just don't think they really work anymore. Um, so I think you've got to really start thinking about your your store as wider than just kind of you know product purchasing. There's obviously we've spoken about things like click and collect. We've spoken around that kind of inspiration piece. And there's almost that role of almost being a dark store. So literally coming way somewhere you can browse, you can inspire and then you can ship out as well and do that fulfillment side. So it's almost and I saw it and it's a bit of a buzzword of rather than sales per square foot, it's experience per square foot. So what is it per square foot of your store that you are offering in terms of customer experience, whether that's browsing, click and collect, fulfillment, all those different areas and really rethinking that. So I think that's a really, really important thing of how does that store fit in as part of your overall offering that is beyond just selling products? Yeah. And isn't there some interesting um, scenarios here? Because I think like in, in our NRF, every year I, I would try to go to retail store tours in Manhattan and, and see these new storefronts and, and these boutique retailers offering really interesting experiences in their stores and, and collecting different merchants under one roof and all these different things. Um, Nespresso with the store where you could not only like get supplies in a machine, but you could sample coffee, right? Like, so, so you, you like that, but then you think, gosh, it's so different if you were an established brand and you have this huge store storefront fingerprint or whatever, and now you're going to have to go through some pain. Like, so to your point, there is a store, but like, if you have a huge footprint of storefronts, that could be painful. I've, I'm going to be watching Starbucks in particular. Cause you know, I think they're going to have to change some of their, their store footprint. Now, how much they're going to have to change. I'm not sure because some of that has to do with like, travel. I do think travel is going to come back. So like, I think the hotel embedded Starbucks are going to be fine, but I'm not so sure about the office embedded Starbucks, because I think some of these corporate office skyscrapers that they thrived upon are not coming back. And so now you have a disadvantage because to your point, yeah, you can reinvent the store, but it'd be better to do that if you didn't have a storefront fingerprint yet than if you have all these stores out there. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, you know, it's the same in the UK. The, the center of London kind of zone one is, is not really residential. It's purely commercial. So Starbucks have got a lot of, lot of stores there as, as have, you know, a lot of different retailers. They are seeing footfall, you know, sub 10% compared to what it was last year, purely because nobody's there and, and you're still sat there having to pay the mortgage. So I think, as you said, that's a, that's a really, you know, tough consideration to, to have. But I think it's almost like the Apple model. So you look at Apple stores, it's not just about buying products in there. It's about the browsing, the inspiration, the tech geniuses that are in there. So I think it's almost taking that model. Obviously, it's hard to you know, establish that kind of square foot that Apple has and, and obviously the budget supporting it. But they're already starting to think about people coming into store to test the products, you know, pick up the latest iPad, the new iPhone and, and, and have a look at it. And then maybe you go to your mobile contract provider and, and you and you buy it through them. But Apple still benefits from that as well. So what is that store in terms of a showroom, in terms of an experience and, and all those different things, again, that actually purchasing is just kind of a byproduct of all of that. Um, so LinkedIn user, he knows he's being bad here because he knows the <laughs> blockchain is outlawed on my show. <laughs> so that, so, um, so, so first of all, that's a terrible blockchain use case um, because, because uh, blockchain is about transparency and I don't want my customers to see what my other customers are getting. And I don't think customers be very happy seeing uh, what other customers are getting either. Um, and, and also have a look at some of the uh, recent uh, news stories about how much um, ridiculous energy the current Bitcoin blockchain is consuming. And think about that from an efficiency and cost standpoint. Um, so I totally reject that. However, um, I, I do think we haven't discussed enough loyalty programs and just the role of that, because I think that's an, I think that's an ever more powerful factor in, in retail, right. Is, is the loyalty initiatives. So. 
A hundred percent. And that has diversified so much in the last five years. You know, before it used to be, you know, dollars off your next purchase or or what or collecting points, all that kind of stuff. But actually now what we're seeing and, and the most effective loyalty programs, like again, coming back to point number five um point number five on here was partnerships. So, you know, using that loyalty program to, you know, get your free Starbucks coffee, get your free cinema tickets, you know, get your you know money off your gym membership. That's the broader loyalty program that people will go for because it's a lifestyle loyalty program rather than being, you know, a really isolated and siloed loyalty program. So those ones are, which are diversified are great. And I think they're going to continue to move forward because that's the lifestyle and that kind of lives with the customer rather than a very binary relationship, which you have with traditional loyalty programs. Indeed. Okay, I think we got one more. Let's see your Last number one. Last but by no means least, yeah, which yeah, I think yeah. is, to be honest, a bit of a uh, a bit of a summary of everything we've kind of talked about, John. Which is, don't tread water. So mm -hmm. I think what we've definitely seen in the last twelve months, and particularly in the first kind of lockdown, is retailers kind of just doing enough to stay afloat. So you know, cutting off the arms to, to save the body and and all that good stuff. What that means is, unfortunately, is you just bleed to death very slowly, and that's what we're seeing mm -hmm. with retailers. So. Just kind of shutting up shop, putting your head down and hoping to, to kind of trudge through it and survive out the other side. This isn't the way to do it. We've talked about, you know, Amazon not destroying retail, but driving that forward. They're going to continue to innovate. They're going to continue to drive forward. And if it's not Amazon, then it's somebody else. And, and the key thing for me is uncertainty shouldn't mean inactivity. And that's the key thing for me. Then we talk about that innovation, the test and learn. There's so many different things you can be doing that aren't, you know, multi-million pound transformation programs requires a bit of clever budget allocation and you can still make progress forward because I think treading water, doing enough to survive, particularly kind of 12 months after the pandemic started, that's just not something you can do. So hopefully everything we've spoken about in the last hour are many different things you can do not to tread water that isn't just, you know, fronting up millions of dollars for a, for a big investment. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, like I... I, this is not a retail example, but there's this band I kind of like called Scars on 45. They're kind of a modern take on Fleetwood Mac, but you know, you know this cliche around like musicians got their legs cut out for them with with touring and stuff, which is totally true. Um, but what they start doing is um, Zoom concerts, right? Um, which have been surprisingly good, and they do all these things where like you can like um, pay for a private encore you know, for additional money and, and have a song sung like just for you on the zoom or, and there's some other stuff you can get like autograph set lists and things like that. But, but the point being like, I, I just think it's so interesting. is like, well, I, I'm sure for a while they were just kind of devastated by, okay, we're screwed. We can't tour, blah, blah, blah. But then there was this creative response that kicked in. And I think that's, that's kind of, I think what, you know, it's silver lining is not the right word, but that's, that's kind of what is interesting about this time is the chance to have a creative response and certainly applies to retail. A hundred percent. And and look, definitely the first, you know, two to six months, everybody was in a bit of shock and a bit of kind of a, a WTF and where do we go from here? But it's been a year now and, you know, we have to start making strides moving forward because if you don't, somebody else will. So it's, yeah, it's time to stop treading water and, and really crack on with, with whatever you decide to do. Yeah. You know, um, I, I wanted to just get back real quick to, um, to, to, to social commerce and, and also the sort of next generation of consumers and, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of talk that this next generation is, is kind of values oriented and they want to do business with companies that, that share their values and stuff. How much stock do you put in all of that? And some of that can be a little cliche. Yeah. I mean, it's always, a, it's always a bit hard when you're, when you're not necessarily one of them. I'm millennial, not Gen Z, unfortunately, but um, yeah, I, I, I do think there is some, there is some validation in there, but I think it comes back to that that point of personalization. There are many different ways to skin a cat and it's not just going to be, a bit, be about the alignment of values. There's going to be other different things that attract them. So when we talk about, you know, they spend hours on TikTok, their Instagram one click, they're shopping with friends, they're live streaming shopping with social influence. There's lots of different things there. It's not just about that, that values piece. It is of course massive, but if you also provide, you know, that frictionless, that uh, kind of uh, shop anywhere that, that Tom has mentioned before, those kind of things are also incredibly valuable to people. So I do think there's legs in that. And I do think that generation do have that. But there's also some other key priorities for them, which is kind of, yeah, that, that mobile commerce and, and, and kind of live streaming. Yeah. And a LinkedIn user says you're being polite by having a sip of water. It's Friday and you should be having a pint, bro. 
Uh, well, we're almost done, so Jake can probably have a pint if he wants in just a few minutes. <laughs> it's actually um, it's actually ten ten thirty here as well, so yeah. I've had a busy week of work. The temptation to have one between work and now has been has been killing me. <laughs> yeah, and, and Jake's been an awesome sport by uh, staying up late, uh, as is our LinkedIn user here, who's on your time zone. So I appreciate um, it. I yeah, appreciate yeah, it. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Do you see Clubhouse in the context of social commerce? Yeah, I don't know if Club Clubhouse has commercialized their model enough yet for that, but it's interesting. It is, it is. And I think how all these good platforms land is by the customer acquisition to begin with. You know, TikTok wasn't about, you know, buying and, and selling originally. It was about these really short snippets of consumable content. So Clubhouse goes that way. I'm not necessarily sure it will. It doesn't necessarily feel like it's that. I feel like it's more of that kind of inspirational, educational community piece. But it's still so new. You know, I only started hearing about it about, you know, three, four weeks ago. So there's still, there's still you know, a lot for it, for it to do before it gets there, I think. You know, what, what one interesting trend, too, around data that I, uh, I was, I sent you a few kind of rip from the headlines things from my PR inbox. The other interesting thing was about the shift of first party data. And this is like a B2C thing more, but like how um, third party data is becoming more and more heavily regulated and locked down. Um, and, and even the notion of the cookie is potentially going to change over time. And so it was interesting to think about that trend also about how, um, brands, they, they mentioned brands like Clorox and Procter, Procter and Gamble, Chipotle and Peloton, both introduced loyalty programs in their apps, the NFL using quizzes to interact directly with the consumer. Um, another interesting trend, right? Like basically figuring out how to earn consumer trust directly, um, I mostly welcome it because I think a lot of these third-party data models of like leveraging data off of partners and stuff were kind of sleazy. So I think it's better, but it's interesting. It is. And I th again, that's the toss up between using third-party partnerships um, either, you know, for that reach, for that immediate growth, for that innovation. But on, you know, the, the flip side, actually, you know, now you're going to start to not have access to that data, which is why you see so many brands go down the, you know, the straight loyalty program like Peloton, for example. But Again, for the consumer to give their data away now, they, they're going to have, they're going to want to see the benefit of that. So what are you doing with my data that, that makes the experience better for me? And again, it comes back to that transparency piece. So if you're collecting my data to know that when you send me my next polo shirt, it's going to fit perfectly, that's fine. If you're sending it so that when I'm, you know, on YouTube and I'm going to get an advert in the corner, I'm not going to be too happy about that. So again, it's being transparent. What you use my data for and, and how is it benefiting me, not you? Yeah. And the final thing, which, uh, you know, in my weekly enterprise hits and misses columns, I talk about the whiffs of the week things. I, I, I might have to call a whiff on the American consumer on this one. Um, I, I got some data that just was real, really shocking to me. Um, it was from, it was from Shogun and they surveyed 2000 U S based consumers, um, about their online and in-person shopping habits. Um, 2000 is not a huge sample size for a consumer survey, but it's not small. Get this data point. 83% of Americans said they'd risk getting COVID-19 to purchase something in person rather than <laughs> online, even when the product's available online and price and quality are equal. I, I sent the PR people a note saying, I find this to be an alarming and confusing <laughs> stat. And I said, I would like to get an idea for why people are willing to risk their lives for a product they can get online. Um, I said, I would like to think that naivete and ignorance around COVID-19 is, is, is part of this because that would make sense, right? If you, if you didn't understand like COVID, then maybe you'd be more willing. Um, but then um, they, they sent back um, something saying that, that, that the vast majority, more than 90% were aware um, of the risks, but we're still doing it. And, and yet substantial portions were still willing to shop on to shop in person and not just for like things like obvious important things. Like I have to see the product in person for some reason, uh, but things like 30, 30, a little more than 30% didn't want to pay shipping costs. And I was just like, Oh my God, like I, I don't understand the American consumer. I, I just cannot uh, get it. So um, anyway, I, I just think what it goes to show you is like, and this is just one survey, so I'm not going to generalize too much, but it goes to show you that I don't think we know exactly what's going to happen in the coming months. I just don't think we know. Yeah, a hundred percent. I agree. It's that uncertainty. And I've actually, I know you mentioned with John, so I actually discovered one myself today and uh, I know I've been very nice to, uh, to Amazon today. So it's probably worth calling them out. And I'm not oh, sure yeah, you've heard about do. it. Yeah, please. Uh, Amazon explore. 
So I'm not sure if you, I, I, I came across it today when I was doing a bit of homework on this and they're kind of providing like live stream virtual experiences, but it just shocked me when you could have a 45 minute virtual tour of Central Park to $63. I'm just not sure that I'm not sure that's something I would wow. pay for, to be entirely honest. But yeah, it just it you can watch cooking courses on there. You can do tours of all these different cities. But yeah, I thought sixty three dollars for a, for a tour of Central Park wasn't something that maybe would would tick the boxes. So yeah, potential whiff for me. And because I've been so nice to Amazon today, it's it's good to call out. Yeah, absolutely. I I I'm interested in these virtual tours. There are a couple on my calendar, but I haven't looked at the pricing yet. And I'm like. Cause, cause yeah, I mean like doing a tour of like the Sistine Chapel right now kind of sounds sort of fun, um, <laughs> but I guess it would really depend on price as to whether I would really go in for that or not. So you make a really good point. I don't know if you, you saw a while back, but I did this one around how um, there's this growing demand for flights to nowhere. Um, yes. People who miss flying so much that they want to just get on a plane and take off and then like land again and go home. Um, now, to be fair, a lot of them incorporate sightseeing, so it's not just <laughs> like getting on a plane and stuff. But I, I just like love that. It's like, uh, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I said, well, if I'm not going to travel, I'm going to enjoy not traveling. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to like drive to my airport and ask if I could sit in a plane for a few hours. Uh, no, and I think I would rather repurpose that uh, money elsewhere as well, and and save it on the travel, and and either save it or spend it on on something for the house or something else. So uh, yeah, not my cup of tea, but I appreciate people who enjoy that stuff. Yeah, evidently there's a bit of a market for it. And hey, to your <laughs> point, to your point, if you have inventory, if you have planes um, sitting around, um, why not? Yeah. So anyway, just to finish out this little anecdote around the around the PR and, and COVID and, and in-person shopping and, and consumers being willing to, um, you know, risk their lives and those of their family um, to, uh, to save on shipping costs, thir- more than 30% said they would. Um, I said, wow, so interesting, especially given you asked about the COVID-19 risks. So there is some risk awareness. I find it amazing folks are willing to do that. I said, granted, some folks are not as high a risk but I have to believe there must be some ignorance on the part of those surveyed as to how complicated and bad it can get um, or, or that you can infect your relatives so easily, but it's amazing to prioritize convenience over risk to yourself and your loved ones. I said, I'm astonished. Um, And, uh, and I'm waiting for a response on that one. So, um, but, but, you know, they're, they're just the messenger. They're just relaying this data, but what a, what a data point, huh? I mean, that's, I was not expecting that. No, I know. I mean, convenience is obviously something we've spoken about and, and having it right here right now is, is really important. And, you know, why wait, you know, a day or two days for it to be delivered and pay $5 when you can walk down the street and get it. I understand that. But in the COVID environment, yeah, maybe. But yeah, one in three people, I don't know, maybe maybe that maybe that feels right. I don't know. You know the American public better than I do, John. So I'll let you call that one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm. I'm just a little bit. Of, I'm, I'm a little bit astonished, but I guess I really shouldn't be at this point. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I live. I do live here after all. But, but, but having said that, um, putting those astonishing numbers aside, I do think that people are absolutely factoring that type of stuff in. At least, you know, in every place that I've been or seen, they're taking all those things into account. They might not make the exact same decisions because I think we have. I think the survey data that would make more sense to me would be data that showed that we have different levels of risk tolerance, which I think is true. And, yeah. and, and obviously that's going to become more dramatic as more people get vaccinated and such and such. Right. And as testing gets better, you know, we'll see more and more of that. One, one interesting little retail note, Jake, is that NRF has an in-person show planned. Um, yeah. For, it's huge. I, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's talk about a, a retail gut check. Um, that's a really good one. I already emailed them and I said, um, I, you won't see me there because I just, I, I just know I won't be ready to go to in-person show in June, but, uh, but it will be interesting to see if they can like actually carry that off. I don't think it will be a massively attended show, but I'll be very curious to see if they can pull it off. Yeah. It won't be, it won't be a Javits size show. I don't think. And like you said, that international audience, which is one of the best pieces of NRF personally, I think. You know, you get a lot of South Americans, a lot of Europeans, and a lot of Brits coming over, which I think is you know, the real essence of the whole thing. So, yeah, I appreciate it when I get a show down. But, uh, yeah, I won't be jumping on a plane across the, across the Atlantic in June, I don't think. Let's aim for January 2022 instead. 
Yeah, absolutely. That seems like a better a better target. But 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 I've written about this before. And we don't need to have a long conversation about this tonight. But I think I do think eventually we may see some hybrid scenarios where where you have a smaller regional uh, on the ground thing that's that's buttressed by a larger virtual event. Um, but it will be interesting to see if if NRF actually carries that off uh, in, in June. Uh, they're they're putting a strong front on it right now, but I think they have to. But I I do I do really wonder about that one. But anyway. Uh, you and I won't be there, so we won't be able to do our catch up podcast. But uh, but it's been great to uh, to get your views on all things retail. I think this was an excellent conversation, viewers. If you have any final things, you better ping it in in a sec. Um, so so what um, so what what trends and and projects are you, you you still do a lot of projects right now? So are there any sort of goals you have for the year? What you're trying to accomplish or? Yeah, so I, I, I guess we kind of mentioned NDA, so I can't mention too much about the client. But actually, when I was talking about delivering those real kind of short-term incremental benefits uh, towards a wider strategy, that's something I'm actually working on with a with a large retailer at the moment in the UK. So obviously delivering remotely, which has its own challenges, but it's really exciting that, yeah, I've been there a couple of months now. And, and yeah, we're going to hopefully see it through this year. So I'm really excited to you know, we've talked about the theory of, you know, delivering these short term agile benefits whilst trying to achieve long term objectives. Now we're living and breathing it and really helping a client deliver it across three or four products. So, yeah, really excited to, to keep pushing on and, and, and really prove that this works and, and can deliver real value. Well, it's cool to hear that you uh, have a lot of project work despite the remote aspect of it. And for folks that are kind of wondering, um, you know, why, why he, why Jake was so on his game today. It's because they've been doing a ton of projects. And so you've been talking with retail customers day in, day out. So that's where all this stuff on the board came from, but what didn't come from uh, sur- surveys or anything that came from your projects. So yeah, made for a great yeah, conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great. It's been really good. Excellent. Well, listen, uh, now you can go have your, have your beer. <laughs> Thanks uh, for the audience comments as always. And uh, we'll catch you next week. I got another interesting guest coming. Thanks a lot, Jake. We'll catch yeah. you. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care.